Hello, everyone. My name is Janine Donnelly, Manager of Webinars for IBM Systems Magazine. And on behalf of IBM Systems Magazine, I'd like to welcome you to our presentation. We will be holding a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. You may ask a question at any time during the event by entering it into the Q&A panel. If you experience technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the Q&A panel to alert us and someone will assist you. You may download a PDF version of the slide deck by clicking on the drop-down menu labeled Event Resources. You'll find that on the left side of your screen. And know that you can download those right from the platform without being disconnected from the webinar. Today's webinar, Getting Started with IASP on IBM I, is sponsored by Help Systems. Our featured speakers today are Ash Giddings, Tom Komodowski, and Tom Huntington. Ash is a pre-sales specialist at Help Systems. Ash began his career on IBM Mainframe before moving into mid-range systems such as IBM I and AIX, and then Windows and Linux. He's worked for some of the largest data centers in Europe and has advised large companies around the world on ways to save costs and improve efficiencies. Tom is a DevOps engineer. That's Tom Komodowski, I should say. With over 30 years of experience in IT, including 25 plus years on the IBM I platform. His background covers a wide variety of technical responsibilities involving network administration, programming, operations, and support. He is, a, he is certified as an IBM Certified System Administrator. And then we have Tom Huntington. He is an Executive Vice President of Technical Solutions at Health Systems and has been named an IBM Champion for the last five years. He oversees business alliances and large customer relationships and ensures that health system software works with other major software and hardware vendors worldwide. And so without further ado, Ash, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Janine. Let's get uh, cracking on with the agenda. So today we're going to start right at the very beginning and talk about what an IASP is. Now this technology arrived with V5R1 and initially required SANS, which, we, which were starting to be used around the same time on the platform. Next, we'll guide you through how, uh, how you go about creating an IASP before explaining how to realize the, the benefits of loading your applications into one. We'll then show you how to deal with IASPs as a sysadmin on a daily basis before highlighting where IASPs really fit in with PowerHA. We also have a couple of live demos sprinkled throughout the session. So top IT concerns. Now, despite the maturity of logical replication solutions and PowerHA, PowerHA haven't been around since, since 2008, I believe, longer, even longer on AAX, the market are still concerned about HA and DR. Some of today's webinar will illustrate how you can use IASPs as part of your solution to this challenge or concern. Now that last slide came from the annual health systems survey. The latest one is available now for you to, uh, for you to complete. We had uh, well over 500 people complete this last year. So if you can take time to look at that link and complete that, it doesn't take many minutes, but um, that information is used, it's anonymous, and it's used throughout the industry by many third parties, including help systems throughout the year. Thank you very much. So how much downtime, downtime can you afford? For something to be considered as highly available, it needs to be capable of having 99.999% uptime. That equates to around five minutes a year downtime. You often hear this being referred to as not 99.999, but five nines. So how do you start to increase your reliability and therefore your uptime? Well, many start by assessing and documenting before eventually eliminating 
the single points of failure around applications. And these single points of failure include, but are not limited to, limited to IBMI partitions running on power. They extend to hubs, switches, routers, uh, data centers, and or cloud. And later in the webinar, we'll cover how PowerHA combined with IS can help tackle the at least the IBM part quickly and easily. Tom, over to you. Thank you, Ash. So let's talk about what an IASP is, or IASP, and uh, I've seen it in many different formats. I've seen it with a lower I and capital ASP. Um, I even called my colleague uh, Ash earlier in the week. I called him IASH. I guess I got so used to saying this, it was kind of confusing. So um, basically, you know, in the, in the raw sense of the word, or the kind of primitive definition, a collection of directories and libraries associated with a database. Um, so on IBM I, uh, this technology allows you to create more than one um, set of IaaS per partition. So each partition on a multi-partition power server running Power9, you could have certainly multiple independent auxiliary storage pools. Or in some cases, they refer to them as disk pooling when you talk about other uh, technologies like Unix. Now, this is not new technology. It's kind of ironic. Here it is, 2020, near the end of 2020, and we're talking about something that was actually put on the server back in 2000. And first of all, it was put in place to help with uh, segregating out Domino and Windows servers that were running on the platform. And then in V5R2, IBM allowed you to put libraries in it. Why do people use the technology today? For the most part, it's with the IBM PowerHA hardware-based replication where you segregate your business data into the IaaS so it's replicated by hardware. And we'll talk about PowerHA towards the end. So that is the main function. Um, so PowerHA uses this technology to replicate from one partition to the next and uh, continues to to do that as things are moved from one uh, one partition to the next from the IaaS. So each uh, partition can have multiple IaaS as we talked about, and basically what you're doing is you're varying off disk on one system and varying them onto the other. Now, um, there are a limitation to a certain extent on what objects can go into an IaaS. Not every object can go into, uh, into an IaaS, but here's a very extensive list of objects that can go into IaaS and, you know, things that really matter when we talk about your data are things like data areas, your programs, your journals and journal receivers related with them, the job Ds, the job queues, and then, of course, your physical files, your files themselves. So um, those all can go in there. So pretty extensive list here. You can even have all queues in there and user queues and user spaces. Um, IBM's you know, thought about most everything. On the next slide, though, we do have uh, a limitation. There are a list of objects that um, can't go in there. Some things like authorization lists are pretty common. Uh, we have controller descriptions, something that I'm sure a lot of you have used. Edit descriptions, some people use that. Device descriptions, of course, people use those. You know, job schedule entries, uh, user profiles is probably one of the bigger ones. So. Uh, these are specific objects you can't move into your IaaS, but they have to stay in something called sysbase, right? Sysbase is really system pool number one from a disk storage standpoint on IBM, and that's what your system comes with when you get it. Ash, I think we're over to you to do our first polling question. We are indeed. We are indeed. So... What we'd, uh, what we'd like to know is uh, how familiar are you with IASPs? Um, does your company use them? So the, the choices here are uh, yes, and I set them up already. Uh, yes, but I need to learn how this works. Uh, no, but we're maybe looking at Power HA as a, as, a, as a form of high availability. Or maybe you're just curious about IASPs. You're trying to find out a little bit more technical information, or maybe you're a, a consultant just uh, just hovering around the <laughs> around for, <laughs> for education. And uh, just just while we have you complete this, and we're really grateful for you filling this in, we'll leave this up and running for a short period. But I just want to let you know that Help Systems have 
a number of upcoming webinars, including one aimed at those new to system administration on the platform. It's called I Inherited an IBMI. Uh, that's taking place next week. And then we have another um, that's going to tackle the what I've called the forgotten art of capacity planning. And that one's penned for October the 13th. And registration is open for both of those on the Health Systems website. Okay, Ash, I have launched the results to the audience. Wonderful. Really interesting, Ash. We have a pretty good split between answer B and D. Um, we have people, about 30%, that are just here. They're curious about IAS. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's interesting. It's, it's funny, Tom. When we, were, when we were talking about this webinar, I was thinking, oh, this technology has been around forever. Surely everyone knows about it. When we came, uh, when we came to do the, the, the kind of technical background, I realized I'd, I'd forgotten more than I ever knew, including the command that, uh, that hopefully we're going we're gonna to share today. So it's, as you say, it's not new, but sometimes it's, it's forgotten. Um, and it's really useful how you can use that with, with Power HA. So thank you, for, thank you for completing that. Well, Ash, Tom, Kay, I guess we've got to move on to how to create an IASP. I mean, I think that that's uh, what the uh, recommendation is. So um, let's uh, talk about the first steps here. First of all, if you're going to create an independent auxiliary storage pool, you've got to have disk units, right? So... Um, Got to have some defined disk units. Um, you can do this through the HMC, through PowerVC, um, and uh, IS can, uh, can, can work with internal disk or they can work with SAN storage. There is a bit of a myth with PowerHA. A lot of people think you can't use PowerHA with internal disk, and that's not true. You don't have to use SAN technology. You can certainly use um, the uh, internal disk with PowerHA because you can create IASP on an internal disk system, okay? Tom K, so I know um, you're, you're a DevOps guy and I know you do a lot with making disk available for us in pre-sales and development and everything else here at Health Systems. Uh, why do you use PowerVC? I, I, I use PowerVC because uh, it's a one-stop shop. Um, in PowerVC, you know, you have your your definitions of your SANs and all of that. With one, you know, one stroke of the pen, it will go out, create a volume for me on my SAN. It will assign it to the partition. It'll attach it there as as a physical disk. I don't have to go chasing down what volumes, how to create them, how to attach them. It's all in one place. Uh, PowerVC is a very powerful tool from IBM. Uh, if you do any kind of partition deployments or working with it, working with the SANs, wonderful tool. Uh, saves me hours and hours of time to to roll out. I can roll out an ASP and I ASP in ten fifteen minutes. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, it, it's like I say, it's a wonderful tool for doing that. So after using basically using the Power VC to to roll out a a, a sand uh, part or VI volume to the the partition, um, like I say, you can for I ASP you can use anything. As long as it looks to the to partition as a physical disk, you can use it as an IASP. Um, I prefer using iNavigator to to create the IASPs. Uh, it's a little bit more graphical, a little bit easier to work with. Uh, you can do it from uh, from green screen. You can do it from the old client access navigator. Uh, we're going to be using uh, the web version of iNavigator. Uh, basically, you go in, you go into your hard your hardware maintenance and it's in disk pools. You create the disk pool there, you tell it you want to you know, create a disk pool, it defines what level you want to create it at, if you want a primary or a secondary IASP. The only difference between primary and secondary uh, is secondary is just attached to a primary, so it's easier to vary on, you just vary on the primary and it brings every, all the secondaries with it. And so that's so here we are, we're using the IBM Navigator. This is the web screen version. This is what comes in the new Access Client Solutions. Uh, it's the direction that IBM is rolling in. The, the client access screens look similar. You've probably used them before, you're probably familiar with them, but like I say, this is the new way of getting into it. It's all done in the web browser. Um, what we have here, all right. Yeah, the screen's over there. 
So here we're picking the disk. So we've we've created the IS. We want to pick the disk that we want to attach to it. So once you have your IS named, then you say I want to, I want to add the physical disk to it. You can add multiple disks to the IASPs. Uh, you don't have to have just the one disk to an IAS. You can have multiples in there. Uh, they can be RAID sets, uh, fully protected. It's all all, all uh, definable as you do it. And this is where we name it. This is this is the name you give your IAS. Um, it creates the pool numbers behind the scenes. The IAS start at 33 and go up from there. Uh, the normal ASs are what two through 32. Uh, there, that's that has a differentiate between the two. So here we're naming our IAS. We're giving it a you know a name that we can associate with it to work with as we work on the system. And then once you have the name and you've assigned your drive. IBM is going to do as they always do on any time you add work with disks and that they're going to format it. it. Takes a few minutes, but once it's formatted, it attaches to the IS. But the IS still is not available. It it it's there and defined, but like any other device, you have to vary it on and and make it available. Uh, and how long does that normally take, Tom? That, that formatting. The formatting that depends on your hardware, your connection. Usually in the virtual world, when we've got a SAN with a virtual through the BIOS, um, it's it's usually on our systems takes about three to five minutes. Um, on the old spinners and physical drives, I've seen it take upwards of 20 to 30. Like it depends on the size of the drive, what you're working with. Um, it, okay, it's, that's good like to I say, it, Yeah, it it does give you a chart showing how far along it is and an estimate of how much time. So. You have an idea if you can go for a coffee or for a lunch. We'll give you a time frame <laughs> for that. <laughs> nice. Excellent. So, so now that our one and only Tom Com has created our our uh, disk for us, then somebody like myself can take over and work from a green screen. I can start doing commands like work config status, and we'll show you that. I can work with my IS name. Um, the IASP that I have here, that's just, uh, you know, it's just a name. So. It is not. It doesn't have to start with IASP. I should should mention that. Um, it has to be varied on, of course, if you're going to uh, uh, be able to to add something to it. So at that point in time, there's you know once he's done that for us, uh, there's nothing in it. We have to get stuff in there, and we'll we'll talk about that. Um, you also can do a display ASP status just to see what status is at. You can do the work RDB R directory entry to make sure that uh, you can connect to the database when you need to. If you're working with IFS, so IASPs, again, you can put your IFS information in there, and certainly people uh, do that for replicating directory. I mean, obviously, we use that quite a bit on IBM I for storing documents and stuff like that. And then you can also do other commands like work live, and, and I'll show you some of those things live here in, in a bit. So. A lot of ways that you can work with this information, um, but I think uh, we're over to Mr. Ash to talk about that exact thing. How do you load your application into an IASP? Thanks, Tom. So now we know what uh, an IASP is, and we've seen how to go about creating it, but what about your core applications? How do you get them from SysBus into an IASP? I know many vendors, third-party vendors, provide instructions on how to do this, so although I appreciate lots of you will have homegrown applications. They're still very common on the platform, but but fear not, this process doesn't normally require any real application changes. And to be honest, it's more to do with job descriptions and library lists. So let's uh, let's let's take a little look. It's all about your data. So how do you about, go about getting that data from SysPass to IS? You simply back up your application libraries. So that could be via save file or maybe a VTL, virtual tape library. Then, this is the key thing, you either delete the SysBus version or you rename it before restoring that library into your IASP. The delete or rename is necessary because you can't have the same library resident in SysBus and IASP at the same time. Now that's that's a key thing. and. A little tool that uh, I think Tom's going to share with you shortly is something called Move Lib Asp. And this is a, an unsupported tool, but it's available on the IBM website. So we're going to have a little little look at that. Nothing scary at all there, Tom. 
<laughs> yeah, and, and maybe you can, uh, you know, we do have that chat feature. Maybe you can share that that link for downloading that. So, well, and, and so it's not only your, your libraries you're going to be moving there, you're going to be moving IAS. So basically the reference to the IAS, again, I'll show you the work link command and referencing my IAS, um, is basically it's a user, user a UDFS, which stands for user defined file system at that point in time. And, and you, can, you can mount uh, basically off the root directory to it. Um, you also can do restore and copy commands to move IFS data into the, the IASP. Um, a little trickier, just as anything with the IFS is if you aren't familiar with using backslashes and stuff like that to reference your save files and stuff on the RST command. Um, but again, you can create a save file. Um, you can use uh, tape, VTL, or your save file. You can then restore. Um, and then here's an example of using a restore uh, live command in here, um, but uh, or we can do the RST copy function. Uh, again, uh, the other option too here is to use a thing called a symbolic link so that you really don't have to change anything on the end user side. You do an add link and then um, you can basically reference uh, them so that they go directly into that IFS whenever they're referencing their data. So it's kind of almost like a behind the scenes change in your library list for the customer. Or for the end so user. Like a, like a pointer then, Tom, is that a symbolic link? Yes, exactly. Exactly. So then a little further on using the RST command, I, I, I was hoping I had this in here. I remember putting it in. but uh, And that is to use the RST command to restore out of your save file. So here we're referencing qsys.lib, my library name, and a save file that I have in my library name. And then we're going to restore that object um, help systems directory installs is what it's called. And I want to include that and I want to install that into my IASP and my IASP is slash IASP one and then the rest of the directory. So that's uh, where I'm restore restoring it to. And as you can see, we're specifying the device and the save file. The object is the, the directory to the new directory. Um, yeah. And then we have the uh, parameter that create PR and directory, it's going to automatically create directories that aren't found as you do this and allow object differences to get around any kind of authority issues. Now there is also a copy function and you can copy um, IFS from Sysbase. There's also a move object function too. And there's uh, from, for, for libraries, you can move individual objects and there's also a move just simply move that allows you to move IFS uh, objects from Sysbase to another IAS out on your system. So that's what this is. Uh, this is showing the copy function. So unfortunately, like everything on IBM IASH and Tom, there's more than one way to to skin this, as, as they say. Okay. All right. So as promised, we would do a little live demo here. So here's here's the really you know scary part, right? Okay, and uh, let me know when you guys can see that on your end. Okay, that's good. Thank you, Tom. Looks good. Okay, good. So, um, as promised, uh, we do a few commands here. So, this is all up to Tom's fingers and how fast they can type on what we actually can see. We're on our system called Able, and if I do F4 here, I can do star dev because the IS ends up being a uh, basically a device and you get at it well i can prompt this here i'll just show you um, if we roll to the second screen here we have star asp all right so i hit enter and i can see my drives are available i can vary them on and vary them off i'm not going to do that because i didn't really tell anybody else that possibly is on the system that i'm going to be doing this demo uh, notice we do have more than one uh, one as is here and typically you kind of want to pick a standard when you name them. Uh, it doesn't have to be IASP. It could just be uh, Fiserv, Euronet, Jack Henry, whatever bank that you're with, and it could be, you know, you could pre-label it that way too. So, all right, so that's that. The other thing that happens kind of automatically in the background, you really don't have to do anything with it. And I always kind of like to bring this command back because I hate typing it. I don't know why, it's one of my least favorite commands, the work. RDB directory entries, and this we'll see in here that both of my IASP have 
a uh, definition in here. Um, but, you know, the neat thing here is that I can put a five. I wish I wouldn't have done that. Okay, so if I put a five in front of here, I can display the details. And um, if I roll down, this will this will show me the actual ASP group number, so 145. And down here, if I display this one, it should be 33. Now, I'm assuming my good colleague Tom K, or Tom Com as we call him, did that for me in the background. Now, um, so what about my library? So I can do a work lib command. And I can do all user. And um, because I did set ISP1 as my group, it shows me on top all my user libraries that are in ISP1 first. Notice that? All right. And then down here, these are all my sysbase libraries. So I can certainly have libraries still in sysbase and libraries out in my ISP. What I can't have is I can't have two Tom Huntington libraries uh, one in the IASP and one in the uh, in the sysbase because the system only allows one library name exactly like that. So what I did is I did set ASP group to get there, and I'm going to show you that command again so that um, I can specify. So if I do ASP01, which is or wait, actually it's 02, that's why we should always have the same naming convention, and I rerun that command. Um, we'll notice I get a different set of libraries. These are basically the default libraries. Yeah, easy for you to laugh. <laughs> I probably did that to myself, didn't I, Tom? All right. Oh, we created um, them differently for a reason. Yeah, we did. Okay, good. So now what I was going to show you is the restore lib command. And so uh, ahead of time, uh, I have saved a library into the uh, – save file called, well, actually, let me just display it. DSP save file, uh, tjh live slash tjh save file. Got to talk myself through it. And, oh, actually, it's got the wrong thing in there. So I guess I better save my library. All right, and I'm going to save it to my save file. And my save file is tgh save file. And okay, do I want to clear my data? So now that saved the, that library in there. Now, if I want to restore that library from there, apologize, I should have had that done ahead of time, but I was, you know, as usual, doing multiple things. Um, and I want to go to my save file. I can do that and save file, and my library name, and then I want to go restore to. So um, I'm going to come down here, and I have to specify my IASP, and I want to also, well, if I want, I'll just do allow object differences star all. And um, my restore library, I'm going to call it something else. I'm going to call it my payroll now. For And, and uh, what device do I want to go to? ISP1. So what that's going to do is, um, okay, I guess we'll just leave that at none. Okay, so now it's gone out there and it's restored that library there. So now to, in order to see that library, I'm going to have to change my ASP group. And I remember I had got way too many things going on here, guys. Um, all right, so now I can display uh, or do a work live and I should see iPayroll out in there. So I'll just do all user again. That's kind of the easiest way to show you this. And now we have this library, iPayroll. It wasn't there before. All right, so that's how you get libraries in there. There's one other command um, that Ash and I were uh, working with uh, earlier. It's uh, movelib ASP. And Ash, where did you get this from? I actually came across this a number of years ago. It's on the IBM website. Uh, it's available in a save file on the IBM website, but it's listed as unsupported. So it's a, it's a, it's a run at your own risk, and it uses <laughs> IBM APIs, um, but it seems to work a treat. It has the ability 
to uh, you don't have to go through the saving, the renaming, restoring. You can check dependencies using the default. That will validate whether that's available to move. And then running yep. it again, you can actually move that library from one AS. Yeah, so what, so what I just did is I said, hey, let's just validate. Because earlier I tried to move a library that had journals in it, and the journal receivers are in a different library, and it says, hey, you can't move them when that's the case. So now... I can uh, press the command again, and it just moved my library over there. So, again, if I go back to our friendly little command here, work live, and I should see, yeah, so now we've added in HA demo I ask. So, there's just a couple different options. You can use restore, or if you get this uh, API, and to Ash's point, it is where, right? All right. So, I'm going to stop sharing here. Um, and make sure you test it out, right? We always recommend testing. Brilliant. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's a it's a great tool, really. It really is. It saved lots of lots of legwork, and it, it appears to work. So, how do we use uh, IASPs every day? Well, there used to be a misconception out there in the community. I'm not sure if it's still a misconception even today that IASPs were tough to implement, and I think the Toms have dispelled this myth. Plus, if you think about it, it's exactly the same concept as volume groups on AIX. Um, they've been around for years. It's nothing new. So I think the, the scary thing is probably the unknown. So how do we use them as admins? It will look. They talk about connecting the job, uh, connecting to the job namespace. So adding the IAS to the jobs namespace. From an interactive session, as we've seen, after signing on to a 5250, there's a command set ASP group command that, when used, sets the ASP for the current thread. Additionally, this command allows you to change the libraries in the library list, also for the current thread. You don't want to uh, obviously have to enter this command or every user enter this command each and every time. So you could add this to your initial program. That would save some uh, some unnecessary legwork. But more common is handling this via job descriptions. These can be altered to a point uh, to point to the IS. And of course, user profiles each have a job description defined. So you need to review and probably tweak those too. We can see the initial ASP group defined on page two when displaying the job D as shown on the next slide. So let me just go forward to, to the next slide here. Uh, here's a job description. And as you can see on the, uh, on the page, page two, on the right hand page there, just up from the bottom, you can see the, the, the initial ASP group defined. Okay, let's get my mouse working again. But how do you point your users to this IASP without them having to use set ASP group? Well, the job description is defined on your user profile. So be sure to change these to reflect any new job descriptions that you define. As you can see, we have a user profile here, Tom IASP1, and it's using a probably a, a, a job description that he's amended where he has the ASP group closely defined. To verify the ASP you're using when signed on to a 5250, you'll see it on the job definition attributes on the work job command. And these can be seen by taking option two after using work job. And you just simply scroll down to the third page. And there you see it, not at the bottom, but one from the bottom, auxiliary storage pool group. So nice and clear and obvious where it is. And here's, uh, what's this? This is a display library list. And note the PWR payroll library, which, as you can see, it's nice and clear. It resides in IASP1. And it's worth noting that those that don't have an ASP device listed, they live in SysBass. It doesn't tell you that. It just assumes that you know that. So if it's blank, it's SysBass. Yeah, thanks, Ash. And then, um, you know, here we are uh, doing the work link. 
And I'm looking I, in my processor up here, you can see that I've specified IAS1, and then I can start seeing directories that are stored in the independent auxiliary storage pool. So uh, very, very easily done for those of you who've used work link command. It's again, probably my second least favorite command on the system. And certainly you can see this information too through uh, iSeries Navigator. Then, then the other thing is, is, gosh, guys, what about batch jobs? What do we do with batch jobs? Well, uh, quite a while ago, IBM put the initial ASP group as a parameter on your Smith job. As a matter of fact, um, for those who might use robot schedule or scheduling on the system of any form, there's also the ability there to specify an IAS if you want. So, very good. Yeah, let's see. All right, how are we doing for time? I think we have time to do a demo again and go back to that uh, famous green screen over there. So, stream here. Let me know again, guys, when you when you see my beautiful black and white screen. Yep, we're good, Tom. Okay. So one of the commands I did earlier that I just kind of quickly went through, I didn't uh, spend much time on, was a command called set ASP group, all right? And if I press F4 on this, this is where we can specify our IASP, um, we can specify our system library list, our current library list, and other libraries that we might want to have in our library list. So, um, you know, I might, I might add um, our, I think it was iPayroll. All right, so I could do something like that. And now when I display my library list, um, I should see iPayroll in there, the one library that we added, and it's in my user library list, along with the you know, SysBase and a few other things that are out there on this uh, particular system. Uh, and then also, um, our job description. I believe I have a job description on the system of ISP1 somewhere. Uh, okay, where did I put that in? I put it in my library. Okay. Ash, I didn't practice this particular one, so bear with me. It was listed in your user profile anyway, Tom. Oh, was it? Okay. Uh, we we can do star all user quick here. All right, uh, of course, it's in QGPL, right? All right, so if I display this job D, um, QGPL slash ISP1, like, you missed an L. Yeah, it's always easier to talk than it is to type and talk at the same time. I will tell you, it's just like, you know, the old saying, chewing bubble gum and walking at the same time, you can't do that. Well, that's me when it comes to typing and talking on these webinars. So we'll see down here that I've specified that I asked one. And why am I doing that? Because um, I have a user profile. If I do a work user profile here and do Tom asterisk, um, and I look at my Tom ASP1 profile and display that, uh, roll down a bit, and uh, we should see the I asked. Well, here's my job description. All right, that's working and getting me into my actual IASP itself. And then my user queue, et cetera, okay? And then my home directory too. So I can have my home directory specifying IASP1. So let's, uh, gosh, I guess we gotta sign on now. Now here we go again, we gotta do more typing. So this is one too. Thank God we didn't create, use Ash's name as the beginning because then it would be Ash, I, you know, I'd be really messed up. Oops, and I already messed up because I don't know why. It's, you're loving this Tom K, aren't you? <laughs> actually, Jan, you know, I will say, Janine gave me a hard time yesterday because she says, oh, you're going to actually do a live demo? I'm like, what? What do you mean by that? Of course I am. So, um, so and, and, and if we do a display library list and, and we see, wow, there's no IAS library in here. Well, my, I still need, I did, in my job description, I didn't specify any current library list or any library list at all. So it's just defaulting on what's on the system. So in this case here, if I want to wa work with iPayroll and um, let's see, what was the other one we created? Uh, HA, oh wait, I think it was I, no. HA demo, I asked, right? 
if I want those libraries, I still have to do that, or I have to put those in my job description. And, you know, as a bad demo guy, I didn't do that. So, okay. So then what happens is uh, submit job, right? So I want to control my batch job, and I don't know, we'll do a very simple uh, work active job. And um, if I specify, actually, what we should do is display library list, all right? And if I specify uh, that job D, um, I could use that or job description um, on down here. I certainly can control the library list. Um, but I also have IASP on the parameter here. I'm going to make the assumption it's – where did it go? That one screen, I think. Oh, right here. I went right by it. Yeah. And I can control my IIS that way, too. So that's, you know, just to give you some flavor of working your way around, it's really not that hard. These are all things. We've all used job descriptions, user profiles. Um, we've used uh, um, uh, submit job command. I, I guess the other one I should show you is the work link. I didn't really have that in my demo here today, but we'll just uh, – Show that quick. Um, so here's my IS1 IFS directory. I do five on that. Uh, we saw earlier one of my commands. I put this IFS out there and and so forth. But you know, it's just really at that point in time, it's just an addressable directory that you can get to that way, or you can even have it on your your home directory. As um, we probably do a work job here and uh, look at our attributes. You know, we can see my job description I'm using up here. And as we roll down, we should see, oh, where's my IS? Oh, there it is, right? All these parameters, they're there. They're just hidden a little bit. you got to find them, right? <laughs> okay. Let's uh, stop that and go back to the uh, presentation, guys. And uh, let's see. I think it's uh, back to you, Ash, right? To talk about Power yeah, HA a little bit. Power HA, yep. Yeah. Um, as we've heard, uh, IASP is a, it's a logical address space that really maps to a set of physical disk storage where the database and the IFS is stored or placed. When powered with, not powered, when paired with Power HA, the term independent indicates that this pool of disk is, is really switchable between other partitions in the PowerHA cluster. Uh, conversely, the system ASP is not switchable. So that's where that, that term comes in. What do we see here? Well, it's incredible to think that PowerHA was introduced for IBM I with 6.1, V6R1, some, some 12 years ago in March 2008, even further back on AAX. It's in, in, implemented in the SLIC, so the size software license internal code, and it's built upon IASP, and it's considered uh, a hardware-based solution built on shared storage clustering technology. One thing to note is that unlike logical replication solutions, the data residing in an IASP can only be accessed by one partition or one system at a time. So you can't use that second IASP for for BI or for backups or, or for reporting, like you can with software-based replication. For objects that can't be stored in an IASP, the admin domain, which is included in PowerHA, takes care of that and takes care of the replication of those objects. And normally, those are kind of limited to user profiles and configuration type objects, shall I say. So what flavors of PowerHA are there? Well, there's, there's, a, there's a good selection now. So geographic mirroring is, uh, is replication performed by IBM I with either internal or external storage. If you're looking for a, a synchronous solution where both copies of disk are kept identical at all times, you can have this. But it tends to be limited to less than 30 kilometers between the cluster nodes or, or partitions. Uh, async geographic mirroring allows you to fully replicate these partitions and is most often used with internal disk and disk where there's typically less than four terabytes. So they tend to be the smaller shops. Global mirror is, is async replication performed by the SAN storage. 
it allows for uh, greater distances than Metro Mirror, but with a higher RPO and RTO. So customers use this type of power HA to replicate over distance, really. And then as we move down the list, uh, Metro Mirror is, is synchronous replication performed by the SAN storage. It gives you two copies of the data and provides a very, very low RPO. But again, that's, that's limited by uh, distance somewhat. London level switch moves a single set of disk units from one IBMI to another to protect, or really to protect against uh, an IBMI outage. London level switching is most commonly used within the same data center for, I guess, what's called in the trade, local high availability, and often gets uh, paired or combined with other forms of HA, such as Global Mirror. And then finally on here, HyperSwap protects against storage device failure across two or more SANs. I know it's unlikely, but if it can happen, it will happen. Two or more SANs with minimal impact, impact to running applications. And it's typically compared with LUN level switching to offer protection or greater protection against both storage device failures and IBMI outages. And I think Tom, you're going to uh, you're going to talk to us about methods. Aren't yeah, you? let's let's talk about um, you know the Power HA Metro Mirror Global Mirror um, option. You know, it's kind of like sand storage. You know, we did the marketplace survey and we asked people well, who's using sand storage and we see that number growing every single year. So with Power HA, I think most customers, especially the bigger ones, will, will automatically go to some form of sand storage with us and they'll be either using Metro or Global Mirror. I mean, we do have customers that are using Global Mirror and as we say, um, uh, to give Ash a little plug for the UK, they can have systems across the pond. They could be a system in the UK and a system in uh, North America and be replicating data here. The thing that you should know though with um, PowerHA and, and high availability is, you know, there is a bit of a limiting factor in that the IASP on the target storage is actually varied off. So if I want to do backups from here or I want to you know, BI or something like that, I really can't do that while I'm doing replication. Um, you can use things like um, people do use uh, flash copy. I don't think we talked about that, but certainly by having your, your data in an IAS, um, your flash copy process uh, goes a lot faster too. So you can use that in combination. So flash copy is not required for PowerHA, nor is PowerHA requiring flash copy, but it's certainly something that you can use. Now, we also have customers that combine PowerHA with our Robot HA product. Um, we talked a lot about moving libraries and, and different items out into an IAS, but there are some things like your system utilities, um, you know, scheduling, security tools, change management tools, um, and there might even be some different uh, business applications that for whatever reason, um, you can't move them to the IAS. There might be some limiting factor. You might be using a combination of technologies and um, that's where there's, there's some uh, great partners along uh, the way that can help out with that, and IBM Lab Services can help you out uh, with if any questions in that area. Um, so data centers, um, you know, if you if you run Power HA in the data center, some people do that, where uh, side by side they'll be doing Power HA in the same data center, and then they might do DR with a technology like uh, Robot HA, a journaling technology. So there's no reason you can't combine the two. Matter of fact, when you implement Power Power HA, it is um, requested and pretty much required that you use journaling on the uh, at least local journaling uh, for your, your system because it is used as part of the rebuild process. Um, so, you know, you know so, so, so of course, in, in that diagram above, we could have uh, had a, a, a third system or a third partition somewhere, it could even be in the same data center where you're replicating data using logical uh, replication or uh, local and remote journaling. And of course, then also people do this for building test data and if you do hit any of the limita limitations too for admin domain, um, one of the limiting factors is like 200,000 user profiles. And believe it or not, some people have exceeded some of those limits over the years. It's crazy. So then we think about, you know, how's this all fit together? Um, here's a diagram. I hope that helps you understand. You know, I can have a product like Robot HA, any of the logical replication products running in SysBase and replicating data from one SysBase to, to another. So when you're using PowerHA, SysBase is active on both systems. 
What's dormant on the second system is that disk pool, that IAS is varied off over on the second system. And so when you do a uh, roll swap, you're basically varying off and varying on your disk. That's underneath the covers, that's really what's happening. And it happens automatically for you. That's why when people go to PowerHA technology and start doing roll swaps, they go, wow, that was a lot easier than what um, we had to do with the previous um, supplier. Um, we also have the ability then too, if I want, I could have a third system in the picture and I could be replicating from local to remote journaling using that, okay? So that kind of concludes our presentation from a standpoint of IaaS technology. Um, we do um, at Help Systems, of course, as you have seen here, uh, do HA software. We also are the ones that actually work on the Power HA technology behind the scenes for on behalf of IBM. But well, you know, we'd love to help you out with many different things. Uh, document management, we do a lot with that. We've had uh, several customers um, using our iForms technology because of AFP being uh, kind of sunsetted on IBM I. So we certainly can do a forms type technology along with managing your documents. And uh, I just talked to a customer the other day, Ash, he had over 19 million documents out in the IFS uh, using wow. web docs. Crazy. Scary. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> scary too, I guess. But Cybersecurity, we help people with that. Monitoring systems, BI, capacity planning as you're looking at your next hardware. We do a lot of sizing for customers. And then uh, finally, uh, automation. And then, you know, another thing to think about, of course, you might already have some help systems products, some other products. And, you know, what do we do for support? One, you can just go out and, you know, Google our website or search for it and, and what we support. Um, today, we do have customers that load robot schedule, schedule directly in an IASP, and you can run it in a different library name uh, than RobotLib. So I literally could have a version of robot schedule running in SysBase and a version of robot schedule running in the IASP. There are some limiting factors with that, um, but uh, you can do that. You also can run the robot alert, the robot council in the IASP. Um, you know, then we have other products that I call them IASP aware. Um, so like our disk storage tool, our a performance monitoring tool, the Healthy on Solutions, the PowerTech Exit Point. Why are these um, IaaS aware? What that means to me is that they can manage the IaaS technology and tell you about it and what's happening there, like disk storage or uh, performance. Or they can, um, in the case of like Exit Point Manager, um, you might want to specifically secure a certain file. We can do those kinds of things too with this. And, um, you know, so. As you, uh, and then we're also always in work in progress. We're working on Robot Schedule Enterprise and Robot Network and getting those in IS too. I'm not sure exactly what the delivery time on that, but that is something our team is working on. So, I mean, the thing to, to remember when it comes to some of these system utilities like we provide in the marketplace is some things don't go on the IAS. You know, QSIS Opera is still going to be in SysBase. Your audit journals are still going to be in system, SysBase. Your system values, um, exit points, you know. Those, those all are going to exist still in SysBase. So sometimes you are living a little bit of a, um, a straddled world between SysBase and IaaS when you do implement this technology. But, um, you know, the nice thing is, is that now I've isolated my business application from the operating system and I have a really good solution for doing role swaps now and I've gotten rid of all the headaches that I had before in managing things manually. So anyways, you can talk with our support team. Ash, anything else to add there from a Halcyon perspective? No, I, 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 we've been asked, can Halcyon run in an IAS? And we, we've we've never we've never needed to run it in an IAS. You can run jobs within that IAS. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think that sums it up uh, great. I mean, everyone's environment is different. So before you, um, I guess, before you embark on uh, implementing IAFs or and or Power HA, just make sure you talk to us about the tools you've got to make sure that uh, we can support you. Excellent. Well, um, we hope you found this session to be valuable. Um, we showed you how to make sure that you define available disk, how to create your IAFs, uh, how to load libraries and directories, um, how to then access this area for end users. And we talked a little bit about some of our products and we talked a bit about the Power HA technology today been wonderful having you here. We've had a very good uh, attendance here. Um, and then, of course, if you have any further questions about this technology, you can just click right from here and go into those links. And then I guess, uh, Janine, we'll turn it over to you uh, to see if we've had any questions out there. 
Thanks, Tom. In fact, we do have a ton of questions. We may not get to them all. So I want to let folks know you're probably going to want um, a PDF version of this slide deck. Don't forget to check out event resources on the left side of your screen so that you can download those before we um, go off the air today. And so, yeah, Tom, let's get started. Um, does object security need to be set up again when the libraries are moved to the IAS? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there, there were, I'll take that one, or Ash, you want to handle that, or? Um, yeah, I don't believe it does. I think it, it remains intact, doesn't it? So whatever work yeah. you've put into place, you know, uh, remains in place. Um, you don't need to re-engineer any object level security. Within yeah, the, I think they may have the seen objects. the data, the errors that I had, Ash, but it's because I didn't fill out the restore parameters correctly. So it's just like restoring a library back to any fresh system. It's all about the, the parameters that you restore and the fact that they user profile exists, right? I mean, otherwise that you can have some, you know, security issues if you don't restore properly. So, and again, yeah. the nice thing is, is that you can build a test environment out and play with all this stuff before you actually go to it, kind of like we've done. Got it. Great. Thank you. You know, the other thing, Tom, I want to mention for our attendees is as you look at the slide, those are live links. So uh, feel free to click on any of the links on this slide. It'll open in a window so it's available to you uh, following the webinar. Okay, let's try this one. Does Power HA give active slash, I don't know if it's inactive, but active active solution for IBMI, like software replication? And then do we face performance issues going with geo mirroring as it uses hosts? For replications? Well, I can probably take the, the first part. Um, not really an active active type scenario with PowerHA. It's more active and, and passive. If you're looking for active active, it needs to be uh, logical replication solutions, really. So typically those that are built on top of remote journaling. Uh, with regards to performance issues, uh, Tom's, any, uh, any idea on that one? Yeah, so GeoMirror, what you're talking about is internal disk. It's really more about how much storage you have. So IBM kind of does put a guideline around that. If you're using internal disk, you you don't want to use uh, PowerHA with that environment if you're over really four terabytes of used uh, disk space. More than that, it's not so much that it won't work. It's just if you have a failover, there is more time in actually varying on that environment. So good question. We probably have, Janine, probably time for one more question. Okay, sounds good. I, it's so hard to pick. Um, let's say, <laughs> yeah, right. is, there's a lot. Is it only one disk per, per IAS, or can you have multiple drives? Yeah, I can, I can address that. Uh, you can have uh, assigned many disks to it. Uh, like I say, you can set up uh, RAID sets to work with it. it. It's basically as if it shows as a physical disk on the system, you can assign it to the IASP, you can assign multiples, multiple disks to the IASP. There's an option that you can have um, the IASP in a rep or protected uh, pool, so it'll basically set up a RAID set internally. Uh, you'll need to have the appropriate number of disks for that, but uh, yeah, you can have definitely have multiples. So you're not limited to a single drive size. Great. Thanks, Tom. Sadly, we are out of time. If we didn't get to your question today, please know that someone will reach out to you via email with an answer. So I want to thank everyone for attending and for all your questions. I also want to thank the team at Help Systems for sharing your expertise with us today. Later this week, watch for a follow-up email. It will contain a link to the recording of today's webinar. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great day and stay well.